Hi, welcome. Welcome to Ashbrook Live. We've got an ex-president on trial in the U.S. Senate, a country that has seen astonishing mayhem, violence in the U.S. Capitol, the heart of American democracy. And big questions about how all this ends, where this goes, what we are to believe in a time when all kinds of assertions are made. Republicans today mounting their defense, big whataboutism defense, played nine minutes of Democrats saying fight for this, fight for that, but none of them saying fight to overturn the voted outcome by American voters of a presidential election. The Democrats, House managers of the impeachment, have brought to the U.S. Senate the argument that that is exactly what the now ex-president, former President Donald J. Trump did. And we all have seen again and again, and in the last couple of days, in new and shocking detail, exactly what that meant on January 6th in the U.S. Congress. It was unbelievable what happened there. It, we've seen pictures of the vice president and his family running downstairs to escape the crowd. Mitt Romney sprinting away, uh, pointed by Eugene Goodman, the kind of hero of the day who turned the mob away from the floor of the U.S. Senate. Uh, again and again, the pictures of policemen being absolutely uh, crushed, buffeted, beaten uh, by this mob in the Capitol. And you may have all seen the images of the cell phones that were collected on the ellipse behind the White House where the president addressed the crowd. And then as he wound up that speech, that crowd heading for the Capitol, where they broke through the barriers, broke through the doors and windows, broke into many parts of the United States Capitol and really shocked the world. What are we to make of this? We're gonna look at it in its own terms today and also in a broader context. My guest is Vivek Wadwa, American thinker and tech entrepreneur who thinks very widely about the world we're in, the intersection of many trends that are afoot in the American reality today and the global reality. I'm going to talk with him about what's driving this kind of craziness, violence, division in our country. He's author of tons of books, uh, most recently from incremental to exponential. Also, Your Happiness Was Hacked, The Driver in the Driverless Car. Vivek Wadwa is a distinguished fellow at Harvard Law School's Labor and Work Life Program recently distinguished fellow at Carnegie Mellon School of Engineering at Silicon Valley. He's got a keen mind and a big view of the world, and I want to bring him right in. It's great to have him with us today. I don't know if you've been watching all day. I've been watching a lot of what's gone on at the U.S. Senate, um, but the whole world has been watching what's up with American democracy. Vivek Wadra, thank you very much for being with us today. It's good to see you again. It's good to be on with you, my friend. Have you been watching since January 6th how this is all unfolded, or are you just off in Silicon Valley land, Vivek? <laughs> how can you not watch it? All over the world, people are watching this, and, and uh, they're shocked at the craziness of America. You grew up in India. You no doubt had an image of the United States. This is years ago now, of course. But did you ever think that you would see American democracy in this state? Tom, I've been brought up all over the world, hardly in India, but ah. the whole world is shocked at what they're seeing here because this is a pillar of democracy. This is supposed to be the bastion of freedom, you know, the sanest company in the world. We've been lecturing the rest of the world. What we're seeing here, we would you know, basically call tin pot dictatorships. And the State Department would be, you know, issuing all sorts of warnings, notices. Other countries would be imposing sanctions on any other, you know, such leadership that decided to declare the elections. Uh, were stolen and tried to incite riots and insurrections. I mean, this would this is the stuff that sanctions are made of. And yet here we are, the country watching again the videos in these days of that mob going in. And in the last two or three days, Democrats, and then today in the defense of uh, Trump Republicans, uh, the attorneys for Donald Trump making their case as you watch it, I don't know, picture yourself a U.S. Senator. Is it clear to you how you would vote in this trial? Tom, it depends on which side you're on. If you're a Democrat uh, Senator, it's clear as can be that you're going to vote uh, with your conscience. If you're now a Republican, you have to think twice that if you say the wrong thing, you're toast, that you're not going to get reelected. Uh, you're going to have your um, uh, you know, voters basically turn on you. 
And that's what the deeper issue over here is. Why are they afraid? Why is it that a significant chunk of the U.S. electorate thinks that this is okay? That they're, you know, they honestly, sincerely believe that Donald Trump has done no wrong, or if he's done any wrong, it's okay. It's not a big deal. So uh, there it is. Assertions being made by Republicans today that, hey, he said, fight or we'll lose our country. And he pointed that mob toward the Capitol. He said he would meet them there. He didn't, at least he didn't as things turned out. Who knows if he planned to meet them there if things had turned out differently. But we've seen the pictures now, the vice president, the nuclear football, who he also, his crew team also carries one, was with him there in the Capitol as all this pressure came on. Um, the Republicans today saying, well, this is about freedom of speech and this is about uh, the freedom of a politician to exhort his followers. And it's no different from what politicians have done in many other times and places. They played a full nine minutes of Democrats saying, fight for this, fight for that. Persuasive to you? Um, I think everyone, even the Republicans know that uh, Trump was wrong over here, that he incited a riot, that um, he, he, he lied basically about the elections because they were voted in the same elections and they accepted their victory. They just won't accept the victory of the uh, of the you know Democratic president. So they all know what's fact and what's fiction over here. the 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 problem is that uh, again they're fearful of not being reelected if they speak the truth. So we're living in a distorted world here. And and the, again, the question we have to ask is, why are people believing this? Why are they tolerating this? So, you know, the Republicans have been the the uh, party of American freedom and ideals and uh, democracy. Uh, they're the ones who, you know, would presumably have been fighting for uh, what's just and what's right. They're the ones now who are basically putting blinders on and accepting that you have a crackpot, uh, you know, uh, president who's still declaring himself to be president. Melania Trump, I don't know if this tweet this morning was accurate or not, office of Melania Trump, I mean, uh, with the seal of the U.S. government on it. So this is la-la land. But why are people tolerating this? Why are they accepting it? That is what's really, really worrisome. So what's your answer as a tech guy here? We, I hope we talk with uh, Lawrence Tribe, big constitutional scholar early next week as this thing is gonna go into the weekend now. But pull back the curtain, look at the bigger frame. Um, maybe Republicans have stood for democracy and American ideals in prior time. But on the other hand, you've got a lot of criticism now saying, hey, there's been the playing footsie here with racism and a lot of things that are not American ideals for a long time as well. It's exploded now and it is incredibly dangerous and divisive now. We've seen armed mobs, not just in the Capitol, but in, other, in and around other state houses across this country. From your vantage, Vivek, what is driving this? Why have we ended up in this situation where we have to be, for the first time in American history, putting a, an, a former American president on trial for things that he did just weeks ago on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Because people honestly believe what Donald Trump has been telling them, that the elections were stolen. They believe that they're fighting for American freedom. They believe that uh, you know, these voting machines were hacked. They believe that the, uh, uh, the media has been taken over by some evil you know, cults and that uh, you know, they believe the stuff that's being put out there because they're living in their filter bubbles. I have, many of my friends are staunch Republicans who are like that. I mean, uh, these are intelligent people. Even in Silicon Valley, you have people who honestly, sincerely believe it. They believe that they're fighting for right and the Democrats are the crackpots over here, that, um, uh, that they've lost their minds, that they, they are doing evil and they have to fight for what's right. They honestly believe it because that's the information they've gotten. They live in their filter bubbles. This is the downside of technology. I mean, I wrote a book about it, Driving the Driverless Car, which warned that uh, technology is, you know, which basically said that technology is making incredible things possible. We have now the choice of achieving the future of Star Trek, or we could be in Mad Max. And it's really how we use these technologies. So the technologies that should have been used for good, you know, social media in particular, have been used for evil. You know, Facebook has made a fortune by uh, spreading misinformation, because if you you know get 
factual news, you don't want to read it, you don't click on, on the link, you don't spend more time on that platform. If you are reinfor if you get information that reinforces your 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 wildest beliefs, your dark views, you read it, you spend time on their platform, and they get to sell you ads and make money from it. So Facebook started feeding a big chunk of the population all sorts of misinformation. And, and then yeah, you had Google following them everywhere. It started sending them videos of the things that uh, they feared. Because why? Because Google makes money on ads as well. And if you're not going to watch this video, you're not going to uh, uh, you know, be spending time on their platform, which means they won't make money. So they started sending you more information. So they keep hearing the same thing over and over again. Their views of the world are reinforced over and over again to the point that they're brainwashed. So we've literally brainwashed half of the United States population using these technologies. And it's not that the, um, uh, the, you know, the Democrats are all right, because they've also been um, uh, you know, brainwashed. They've also been pushed to the extreme. I have as much of a problem with the extreme left as I have the, with the extreme right, because you have both sides now that believe what they believe, and they believe the other side is evil, and they're ready to kill each other. And you, that's what you saw on Capitol Hill, that these people were ready to kill. And, and um, it, what Trump would have done if they had you know, uh, taken over is declared martial law and found a reason to stay in power. That was, that's what his grand plan was. Except the good thing is that there were enough checks and balances that we hadn't been polarized to the point that American democracy fell apart. So, you know, we, we were saved by, this, by the, the strength of American democracy and, and its institutions. All right. We know that the media, the technology of Facebook and more can be very polarizing and can corral people into their true believer camps. But are, are you suggesting that left and right are equally detached from reality here? I mean, there is a reality. People did gather on the ground. They did go to the Capitol. They broke the windows. They went in. They had weapons. They had cuffs. Um, now, the reasons behind that I suppose are, are open to different interpretation, but uh, is it really that everybody's just floating in a sea of clubhouse fantasy here? I don't think so. I don't think it's equally weighted, but do you? Tom, um, you know, I, I think that the, uh, the wackos on the right have gone too far and they've been become more polarized, but you also see the same uh, set of type of forces on the left, this whole cancel culture, political correctness, I mean, people uh, uh, being uh, singled out for having views that aren't uh, you know, perfect, uh, or digging up all sorts of dirt on people. I mean, all of us have experienced that in one form or the other, right? So that is the other extreme of it that you, you do have a problem with both sides. So I'm not you know, gonna say that the, the left is right, the right is wrong. And no, I, I see faults in both sides, frankly. Now, uh, here you have more of an extreme. Here you have the equivalent of ISIS. You've got the terrorists who took over Capitol Hill. But you know, again, you have those ISIS types of people on the left. I mean, the, the, the Republicans call it Antifa. I don't think there's any such thing as Antifa, but there is an extreme element which has been you know, rioting. If you saw what happened in Portland, right? The place was on fire night after night after night after night after night. You, you saw the extreme left at, at work also. So both sides are at fault over here. And it could be that one is more at fault than another or the, the most extreme wing, wing of you know, one side got support from the president of the United States. Therefore they did, did things which others wouldn't have done. I mean, there's been a lot of commentary in the last days uh, certainly, the Republicans have made much today of Black Lives Matter protests over the summer. Of right. course, those were aimed at uh, social justice and trying to bring attention to centuries of racial injustice in this country and its continuation and uh, instances of police brutality that are far too numerous and systemic racism that is objectively visible in American society, in the American economy, um, of course, but Tom, no Tom, protest I'm, is I'm, perfect. I'm at every yeah. But the methods that, that you know, yes, uh, those are genuine grievances. But the methods they use of hijacking cities, of setting fires, okay, the extreme methods that they use are not acceptable in 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 any society. So yes, it, it, and yet, and yet, even there, you know, we saw a lot of peaceful protest. There, we saw 
um, some of those instances of fire and destruction who were uh, documented to have been uh, spearheaded by non-BLM protesters after it was all over. And in any case, none of them went to the seat of the American democracy and tried to disrupt the counting of American votes. So yeah, you can definitely uh, object to some of the means over the summer, I get it. And yet, there seems to me to be important distinctions to be drawn here. I, I wonder where you are on this spectrum of thinking about, all right, technology creates filter bubbles. It, creates, it can create fanaticism. It can create blindness and, and alternative realities, realities or just fictions that people live in. Um, but, and human beings are sus very susceptible to that. And yet there's another strain of human life that kind of came with the enlightenment, with searching for facts, with searching for objective reality, that people pursue it at the same time. Does, does technology really throw us into equally detached, unreal realms? Is it even um, let me take it. looks to me like there's a there's a there's an urge to find truth that I don't want to discount or throw out uh, along with people who have embraced kind of QAnon fantasy world. Tom, let me take you to an, uh, into a parallel universe. In this universe, Donald Trump, instead of becoming a Republican, became a Democrat. He was originally a Democrat. He was giving you know uh, to uh, the Clintons and so on. So he he was originally on that side. And the message that he had was a populist message appealing to uh, the disenfranchised, uh, you know, lower class and so on and so on. He became a Democrat and, and um, uh, the Republicans were what they were, uh, they, you know, but he became um, a Democrat and he was in power now. He's in the White House. A Republican, now he, a Republican in the White House. Uh, no, no. The Democrat, oh, now, imagine now, if he had. Imagine if okay. uh, this, this. Pretty hard this, to picture, but all right. I'll write along reality, with him. No, uh, Trump doesn't have any political views. He just basically did whatever he had to do to gain power. Okay. Well, I mean, he said decades ago now that yeah. those kids in Central Park were guilty when that wasn't true. And he would have said anything uh, just to get elected. Okay, this Yes, is a but he wouldn't have been a Democrat and made any progress with <laughs> but, that kind of posture. But Tom, he, they were, uh, I mean, Tom, I mean, what Donald Trump did was he mastered technology, in particular social media, and he mastered media uh, to be able to manipulate uh, populations. He could have gone any way politically. So let's say he was a Democrat in the White House. Now, instead of in, in inciting the white uh, supremacists, he now had the extreme uh, left uh, you know, uh, take over uh, the, the White House, basically come in and take over. And, and it's the same way that the cops, you know, were restricted in what they could do. He held back the, the military and they stormed the White House. That was equally possible because what was done over here was that in a segment of the population was brainwashed into believing certain things. And you had the master manipulator who knew how to program these people. They, they, you know, right now, right now the evangelists, uh, evangelist Christians, even though they may, you know, they have, uh, they claim to have the highest moral and ethical values, they know that he's uh, a sinner by every definition of the book. I mean, they know about how sick he is. They know, they know about um, his wives and his, you know, all of the things he's done. However, they turn a blind eye to him. Why? Because he bought them off by giving them, you know, some things that they wanted. He knew how to manipulate them and get their support. So Don uh, is the con over here, okay? So, but the fact is that he was able to leverage these technologies to manipulate people. And he could have done it in, in any direction um, in a different reality. So the, the point over here that I'm making over here- That reality is too different for me. He's clearly, he's an intu gifted intuitive demagogue. He's also an intuitive racist, I would say. If you look back at his history, uh, that's been a constant element throughout. And- well, so I mean, yeah, but I, I think Tom, Tom, I tell you, I, I'm being an Indian over here. I tell you, looking yeah. like how I look like. I mean, yeah. I've experienced racism from the from the left as well. Okay. Oh, I they don't people, doubt that. I'm not saying. Yeah. That we, so we, they're racist on both sides. Racist. Yes. Uh, don't ref uh, Republican Party is not the, the party of racists. Both parties have racism. Racism is inherent in in societies and cultures and values. Indians are racist. I mean, Africans are racist. This is just the way it is, okay? That's part of uh, the, the flaws of human nature. So, but the fact over here is that it's how you manipulate people by you know, being able to persuade the Christians that a, the, uh, the ultimate sinner is a reincarnation of Christ is hell of a sales job. 
But he was able to use the tools of today to do that. In a different era, even 10 years ago, he couldn't have done that because he wouldn't have had the megaphone of social media and of YouTube and of technology and being able to target voters and uh, you know, using Facebook ads. Well, I mean, why you say he couldn't have done it. Demagogues have arisen in all eras over eons of human life and society. The founders of this country were very aware of the danger of demagoguery and the power of demagoguery, if not handled correctly. The 20th century saw plenty of demagogues and worse who rose in the absence of social media. I mean, it's not as if it took Facebook to, um, to permit the, the rise of demagogues. It, but it's happening exponentially faster and on a scale that was unprecedented. Before the demagogues would have to go and speak in front of audiences and persuade them. And when the printing press came out, it enabled them to write things down and spread it. I mean, there was there were uh, you know a lot of d- a deep concerns about the printing press, of course. how it'll polarize. It. The Christian Church was terrified about it because people could now uh, you know question their beliefs and so on. So that was a technology, but it was on a small scale. You couldn't micro-target people, and you know do things at the at this at, at the pace that it's been done right now. Within months, you're able to polarize an entire you know a big segment of the population. We never had those tools before. You can do it on a scale at a pace that was unimaginable before. So is it, sir, is it, does democracy survive this? Does American democracy? I mean, you've got a wave of nationalism in India at this point. You've got populism that's risen all over the world. We, look, we see it very clearly in Brazil. You've got European nations inside the EU, Hungary, Poland, who are struggling with this right now and beyond. Uh, do, you, do you see technology at work in all these instances? Uh, the smart ones all over the world are using technology. The battle that India is having right now with Twitter is because it wants to control the messaging. And not only does it want to control the press, but it also wants to control the social media messaging. So the Indian government is very capable, is very competent at controlling their messaging. This is how Narendra Modi has kept his popularity. And by the way, I don't disagree with him on uh, uh, you know some of the policies implemented. The farm uh, bills would have helped the majority of farmers. However, it was spun, and these people were again were misled, saying, "Well, actually, uh, the segment of uh, uh, the well-to-do farmers are better off with the old way of doing things. The majority of them would have been better off with the new way of doing things, with, with open markets and so on." But, but again, there was misinformation being spread in India, and now you've got India basically, you know, having this is happening worldwide that you're using technology for spreading misinformation at a scale and at a pace that was never possible before. That is what has changed. How, how do democracies survive this? So that right. some kind of uh, um, just stability returns to India so that the United States is not looking at impeachment after impeachment, not just swinging wide, wildly. Uh, the technology is there. How do we get a handle on it so that it doesn't... I mean, look, people always have a frame of reference. They always have a kind of a narrative of reality that goes on in their minds, which may or may not comport with what someone else sees as objective reality. But if it's too wild, if it's swinging too wild, this gets really hard to handle. And we're seeing that worldwide right now. What do we do about it? Not to well, just get stability for stability's right. sake. I mean, there, are cha- there is change that's needed. There, there is, people do need to be riled up about some injustices. There's no question about it, but we need some kind of path toward a, 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 at least semi-orderly agreement on issues and approaches. How do we get there? Tom, uh, this is what I've been screaming about for several years right now. That it's not only, see, right now we talked about social media. Mm. It's much more than that. Over the next five or 10 years, you have artificial intelligence. You have sensor devices everywhere. You have cameras everywhere. Mm-hmm. We're now going to have synthetic biology. Synthetic biology with which you can cure disease or you can uh, you know, create new pandemics. Mm-hmm. We're going to have quantum computing that's going to bust apart every digital lock in the world. There are a whole range of technologies that are advancing exponentially. What I've been saying for the longest time is it's it's how we use them that's going to now dictate whether we achieve Star Trek or Mad Max. Because in this case, we didn't have any checks and balances on social media. So you had Zuckerberg going from being Luke Skywalker. He was fancying himself as president of the United States at the age of 32. Mm. And now he's become Darth Vader because he sold his soul you know, in pursuit of money. And he polarized, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a lot of what, the evil that happened here is Zuckerberg's fault. 
but he enabled it, right? But the, the fact here is that this is going to happen over and over and over again with technology after technology after technology. If we don't get it under control, if we don't start thinking about these issues and having discussions and coming up with sensible policies, we're doomed. We will literally be you know, tearing society apart. America survived this insurrection thanks you know, to, to its democracy being strong enough and the forces of evil being weak enough at this stage. But it won't always be like this because you'll have many other polarizing technologies. AI has been uh, you know, used with social media to manipulate uh, you know, people's views and so on. The AI we have today is baby stuff compared to the AI we're gonna have five years from now. Talk about that. If we have an unreconstructed social media realm, digital realm, and now AI is added to it in terms of public influence, shaping public understanding of the world, how, how does, how will AI um, leave its mark on that? What, what are the changes that AI will introduce? Well, AI basically is getting better and better at understanding us. Uh, so, uh, you know, in many cases, it knows a lot about us. Soon it'll know us better than we know ourselves. It'll know our lifestyles, our habits, uh, you know, so we'll have robots at home that are able to, to look after us and, 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 you know, do care for the elderly and, uh, you know, get us a beer when we're watching the Super Bowl and, and things like that. The next five or seven years, we'll have robots like that. That can but, do it. But what about Facebook? If it's Facebook on AI steroids, how does it change? That terrifies me. This is why I've been advocating that we need to have tight regulations. We need to have data privacy laws. We need to break Facebook up so that they don't have control over everything. And we need to uh, uh, you know, put uh, Mark Zuckerberg under house arrest and take his internet. I haven't said that. I'm just joking about that. But the point is we need to rein these people in because they're out of control. So I've been very vocal about the need to restrain the tech industry and, and bring it, you know, and create the checks and balances. Uh, so that needs to be done immediately because we've seen the damage it's done already. But there are many, many, many more technologies that are coming up which are going to create these difficult scenarios. You know, the, let's go through what went through, went through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, there were rumors that whether uh, this pandemic was engineered or not. It probably wasn't deliberately engineered. It was probably a lab accident in Wuhan. So I, I, I subscribe to those uh, theories that it was something which, and the Chinese government couldn't control it, and now they're trying to suppress it. Regardless, they didn't engineer this one, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. The next virus could be engineered because it's pretty easy to put all the pieces together. And for a few thousand dollars, you could engineer an, a, a, a more lethal strain of uh, a coronavirus or the bubonic plague or other uh, you know, viruses and spread them all over the world. You could also, uh, with the same technologies, we can also cure cancer. You know, just like the, um, the, the mRNA uh, uh, technologies we used to develop vaccines, mm -hmm. they could be used to treat cancer and to treat almost every other disease. So you've got the ability of synthetic biology to do good and evil at the same time. There are no checks and balances. People don't even know it can be done right now. I wrote a piece for Foreign Policy magazine in which I was warning about the dangers of synthetic biology. And I had the synthetic biologist screaming at me as loudly as could be on Twitter, saying that, you know, we're not evil, we're not doing this. I say, but you could do it. And, and, and so those are the type of debates that we had, in, had had. But the fact is people don't even know, even know it can be done. So unless we become, so social media, I wrote a book about it. I wrote a book called Your Happiness Was Hacked, how the tech industry is trying to steal your happiness and what we can do about it. Um, and that book warned about how the tech industry was using AI to manipulate us, right? The book didn't go anywhere. I mean, it, it, it sold a few copies, but, but the fact is that, um, it, you know, um, we've known for a while what, the, what this tech industry could do with these technologies, yet we did nothing about it. We have many, many, many more technologies coming up over the next decade that are going to be an order of magnitude more lethal and, and more beneficial than social media. We need to wake up and, and uh, learn these things and do something about it before we self-destruct. That's a big landscape you're laying out there. And there's, there's a lot to work on and a lot to worry about. The sort of immediate challenge is the political challenge. And their, you know, the, the challenge at hand, their social media has been the wag the dog technology. Right. And uh, people have just been kind of at loose, at, stymied about what to do about it. I mean, the, 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 the internet was born with the section 230 freedom from responsibility for what's published there. And that permitted tremendous growth, but it also made everybody <laughs> able to make money by putting anything up. And without being, you can't be sued. It's not your responsibility, it's not their responsibility. Uh, is, that the, is that the key in the lock of getting back to something more sane? Can we, can we bring in a fresh framework that 
dampens the extreme uh, what fantasy creation and polarization that we've seen to date. That's one of the things. I mean, you know, when you were at NPR, you were very, very cautious about which guests you brought on, uh, on and, and what they said. You would edit in advance to make sure that you weren't saying anything derogatory or, or inaccurate. Well, it was always live, but we were very careful about who we talked to and, and to try and I'm always, even now, to be as factual as possible. Yes, it's very much on my mind. Because you were liable, right? So on the other hand, Facebook can be minting money by allowing people to spread all the misinformation they want. In fact, the more misinformation they have, the more money they make. So, so they, they get, get, literally are able to get away with murder. And Facebook has been accused by the United Nations of incit inciting genocide in Myanmar. So mm -hmm. the fact is that they literally could you know, uh, commit murder or, or enable murder and get away with it. That's because of Section 230. So Section 230 obviously needs to be reined in. It needs to be rethought. For the, uh, for the digital era, but it's much, much more than that. The fact is that right now, Facebook believes it has a right to our data. Facebook is now trying to get into the health business. They want to have heart monitors that monitor every moment of your lives. They want to have cameras in your homes. So does Amazon. They want to keep track of everything we do everywhere we go because they believe they own the data. They own us, right? Why do they own the data? Why, aren't, why don't we have data protection laws that forbid them from you know, you know, storing our data? Fine, they may give us a, a, you know, a camera or a heart monitor, but they're not allowed to, to analyze that data or do anything with it. That's our data, it's held in our locker, and we can license it to them if we want. And, and if we license it to them, then we get a cut of whatever revenue they get from it. Otherwise, it's not allowed. That's a very simple uh, rule change. I, you know, I have uh, the right, you know, I mean, the, the US Constitution gives me many protections. Why doesn't, uh, why don't I have the protection to own my own data? Why do, why do these companies have the right to, you know, pick up any photograph of, of me on the web that I post to share with my family and use it for marketing purposes or any other conversation I've had or anything I'm doing, my, my location, my movements, my contacts. Why do they have the right to take that and do whatever they want to do with it? It's mine. It's not theirs. So that's another law that needs to be fixed. We just had a terrible shock in what we saw on January 6th. Really nothing like it in American history. Uh, do you see it as enough to shock us out of complacency about the framework that's encouraging that kind of extremism, that kind of violence at the heart of the Capitol? Yeah, the good news is that both the Democrats and the Republicans now know that Facebook is the enemy, that the technology industry is out of control, and both sides agree on regulations. Even the Republicans who are almost anti-regulation, you know, regulation, they now want regulation. So that's a good thing that came from it. Now, the question is, will we go from there to getting sound regulations? I don't know. Because the problem is that the tech industry also gives big money to the politicians and they go where the money is. So my fear is that the rules and regulations will be, will be diluted simply because these politicians want to get more kickbacks from the tech industry. Um, and so you know, they're going to buy their way into whatever you know, useless regulations they can get. When you, when you hear senators making their cases and, and the House managers on the Senate floor making their cases, do you hear people who, and the attorneys for the president, do people, do you hear people who are soberly assessing reality? Now we know these are, you know, they're making arguments there for and against the president, but do, do you see moorings in reality? Do you, is, is it just a classical willingness to take the argument where it needs to go to defend uh, uh, the, the defendant in this case, the president of the United States? Or do you see people who actually don't know what's real. Tom, I see the filter bubbles. I see people who don't know what's real, that the information they gain, even Donald Trump, I mean, for all, you know, all the criticism of him, what he was hearing from his advisors and from the, his psychopaths were that the election was stolen. He may, on, you know, despite everything, he may honestly believe that uh, uh, Dominion machines were controlled by Nicaragua, or God knows who, and that uh, the election was stolen from him because that's the information he's getting, gaining. He watches you know, these extreme uh, uh, new TV networks who are echoing all the lies. So that's the information even the president of the United States get. He, doesn't listen, he didn't listen to his intelligence people. He listened to these uh, you know, psychopaths on, on um, you know, social media and he heard what he wanted to hear. So this is how, uh, how much damage was done by these technologies. You grew up or were born in a democracy in India, as you say, I guess you grew up all over the world, but. Um, when you look at Indian democracy, American democracy, 
up against these challenges. And I'm not willing to concede that it's all about us being manipulated by technology. Democracy always has to deal with adversity. There are, there are many kinds of um, psychological elements, economic elements, climactic, climate elements these days and in the past that could stress societies and stress democracies. But we've got this new element of turbocharged digital factors. Right. Um, is democracy up to it? Can it survive this? Yeah, uh, frankly, I think we will survive it. And that's the beauty of a democracy. It's the dictatorships I'm worried about. You know, China trying to uh, now uh, commit genocide and control its uh, rest of population. When the population is also getting, you know, different types of emissions as they clamp down harder and harder and they get in, into more extreme filter bubbles and so on. Democracy has a, you know, pressure, has a relief valve. That's the beauty of it. So, you know, Trump and his people went too far. So we basically booted them out and we brought the Democrats in. No doubt the Democrats will also make mistakes and they'll get booted out. That's the good thing about democracy and we keep learning and growing and evolving. So the best hope we have is to have the, you know, have the freedom that we have to debate and, and battle each other. But we also need to wake up now and start tightening the regulations so that we don't have a middleman here, which is the tech industry, which is manipulating us or the creators of these new technologies I talked about now using them with no checks and balances. What did you think on that day, January 6th? Were you watching? On the, and, oh, was and, I, and I have, uh, have to say on the 6th and in the days that followed, because somehow on the 6th, a lot of cameras were, you know, were outside the building. We weren't seeing quite the gruesome detail that we saw later. But what's gone through your mind as an immigrant to this country, Vivek, who's embraced this country in so many deep ways, uh, as you've watched this, what, what, are you, what are you thinking about the character of American democracy and American society? Tom, when 9-11 happened, I had tears in my eyes. I was watching every moment, day and night, okay? The same thing happened when uh, the Capitol Hill was taken over. I, was, I, was, I didn't sleep. I was watching TV around the clock, watching it and saying, oh my God, what happened over here? How could this happen to America? So I was horrified. I was stunned. I was shocked. But like I said, it was you know, reliving 9-11 again mm -hmm. because you didn't think it could ever happen here. And yet it has. I don't mean to, to other you with that immigrant status. I've got a family that's generation after generation of immigrants and, and immigrants in the current generation as well. And yet there's been a vision that didn't really include that, that didn't include the Vandals and Visigoths storming the US Capitol. That was not part of the narrative that drew people here or that I think anyone ever expected, expected to see. And you don't think that uh, Trump is singular in his demagogic instincts here. You think that there's a new window to be exploited that others will step into after Trump if it's not closed, tightened, reined in? Trump is a trend. Okay, he's just a, a you know a, a smart uh, con guy. Basically, you know he knows how to manipulate. That's how he built his whole career. So he manipulated. He took advantage of, of you know the situation. There'll be others, but the fact is uh, you know the, the the fact that you have so many others now echoing his words shows you that shows you that it's a trend. And if it wasn't him, uh, there would be someone else, and there there will be other people like him in the future. That's just the way it goes. People have always been able to manipulate. Uh, others and we'll have others, uh, we will have this happening again and, and they're gonna be using technology to the fullest to, uh, to enable this. You spent so much time in Silicon Valley, what's the conversation there? Is there self-awareness? Is there readiness to accept new constraints, to accept being broken up if you're Facebook or others? Um, is the Silicon Valley, after a couple of decades where they were pretty full of themselves, do they have a sense that in some dimensions they've be they have become a a menace to the society? There are multiple Silicon Valleys here. If you look at the rank and file, they're generally, um, uh, you know, cons they're, they're generally liberals and they're in a state of horrors. This is why you've had Google employees, uh, okay. you know, rebelling. Uh, Facebook, uh, you know, the, the uh, approval ratings of uh, Zuckerberg are, are lower than Donald Trump's, right? So, um, so the, the rank and file are um, very much in tune with what we're saying. And then you have the power brokers, you have, you know, this, the, the Zuckerbergs, and then you have the Andreessen's, you've got the power brokers, the venture capitalists who are feeding it. 
they call themselves libertarians. Why libertarians? Because they don't want to pay taxes. They don't want any checks and balances. They don't want any government regula regulations. The in thing in Silicon Valley is to be a libertarian for those reasons, not because they believe in libertarian values, but because they don't want any checks and balances. So then you've got the Silicon Valley mafia, the, you know, the boys club, the elite club, the people I've been attacking who are on a different plane altogether. And they supported Donald Trump because he was, uh, you know, cutting taxes and he was giving them what, 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 what they wanted. And they were pretty much in sync with his racist views as well. So this is which so you, you, like I said, you've got the haves and the have nots even over here. But the good thing is that the majority of the peop people here are open minded. They are, uh, you know, uh, sorry, they want the, uh, you know, to do good for society. They, they mean well and so on and so on. But these, these aren't the people in power. We were talking last week with the brilliant uh, American astronaut, Jessica Meir, uh, at a time when there's so much going on in space and, you know, Elon Musk wants to, I think, retire on Mars and um, Jeff Bezos uh, wants to build giant floating space worlds. Um, Musk is, put up, is putting up this new space uh, Starlink uh, necklace of internet satellites. Uh, can Silicon Valley move beyond the reach of law and democracy, beyond the reach of a consensus of the American people, just for starters, let alone the rest of the world? Tom, the reason why I talk about Star Trek and Mad Max at the same time mm -hmm. is because we are building the Star Trek future. We now have the ability to go on different planets and within a decade or so, we will now be able to have space tourism you know, to moon and let, you know, you go there uh, and take a flight there and you come back safely. That's going to be possible. A decade from now, we will have autonomous self-driving uh, electric vehicles. The cost of energy will be practically zero. We will have, will be, a decade from now, literally will be an era of almost unlimited clean and free, you know, energy. We, we're now going to be able to yes, cure please. diseases. We, we, we're going to have, uh, 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 you know, we'll be able to just go on our, you know, virtual smartphones, press a button, and up, and a sh car shows up uh, to take us to anywhere we want to go, uh, you know, going through hyperloops at 200 miles an hour. I mean, all of these amazing things all happening at the same time, you know. So you have that, and then you have the discussion we just had of uh, you know uh, uh, insurrections and and polarized societies and ripping each other apart, both at the same time. So what? Where, where do we go? Do democracy stand up? Do we now, honestly, make it to Star Trek? The choice is ours. It's really how we come together as, as uh, you know, as a ra as a human race, and how we uh, uh, use technologies, how we use them to uplift, uh, you know, technology. How we deal with the problems of inequality, because we'll also be able to three different houses, and we'll be able to three D print food. We'll have vertical farms in which you grow organic food locally, and the food costs a tenth of what it does right now. Within five or seven years, you're going to be going to McDonald's and have a choice of a synthetic hamburger that costs a third as much, which tastes even better than the uh, than the cows we killed. Um, and so, and, and, I mean, all of these things are happening in the next decade or so, good well, and bad at the same yeah, time. Okay, I mean, I a lot of these things we can use, uh, very low cost, um, non uh, carbon energy, yes, please bring it as soon as possible. We need it desperately. But of course, we're, we're no longer quite starry-eyed about all the whiz-bang stuff to come. If it's also going to come with deep social stress, violence, eruption, disorder, um, I mean, it's one part of this is the kind of filter bubble, detested from reality. The other is inequity that we've seen uh, and, and I guess I come back to the question of whether we can get our arms around this, whether we can put a harness on this in a way that doesn't, that doesn't cripple innovation because God knows we need it, but that also somehow uh, can exercise the power and wisdom to bring it in line with human flourishing. What are the odds? Tom, I, I want to respond to you in one sentence. Welcome to the future. <laughs> the fact is that we're there now. We can't stop it. We can't stop the advances in AI. We can't stop the advances in, in uh, computing. We can't stop the advances in synthetic biology, in robotics, uh, you know, um, in all of these things, it's unstoppable right now because there's no one country that's in control of these things. You know, Donald Trump wanted to bring beautiful, clean coal back. So he did everything he could to stop the progress of solar. And guess what? 
China, India, you know, the rest of the world took them to the United States and they started plowing ahead. And those technologies have become uh, cost competitive and it's on a, uh, an autopilot right now. You can't stop it. So it's the same with every other technology that we're there now. You can't stop it. The question is, what do we do about it? And this is why these conversations are very important, that we need to start understanding what is going on and we need to start coming to a consensus on how we you know, use these technologies. We need regulations. I hate to use the word regulations because I don't you know, want more government control of anything, but we need government to step up and, and start providing guidance to the people creating these technologies and telling them what is acceptable, what's not acceptable. It's a, quite a picture where even if we do take some of these steps, other nations may not. China is moving rapidly ahead on um, all kinds of biology fronts. And we've seen there even reports of, you know, human biology and genetics. and Synthetic, yeah, I mean, uh, CRISPR, gene editing, creating yeah. superhumans. I'll bet you that in the lab, they already have some babies that have been constructed with some superhuman characteristics. They're testing them out. So it would be, we would never do such a thing in the United States, but I'll bet you the Chinese are already, uh, you know, uh, bringing, uh, uh, producing babies with, uh, with edited genes. AI, they're on a super track. I mean, huge focus on AI in China. Right. What, what does that mean for the United States? Do we become like um, the equivalent in a previous age of, a, of an indigenous uh, culture that doesn't want to adopt new technology because it has values that feel threatened by that technology. Does that, is that the, the American future? I, Tom, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, but because they, you know, the, the good thing is that China is very good at stealing and copying uh, and they do incremental innovation. They're not able to come up with world changing things yet because on, in their regimented society, you're not, you're not allowed to take the risks we're allowed to take. You're not allowed to experiment. You're not allowed to defy the rules and the government. So therefore you're restrained. So much of what they have is, is stolen pirated technology. So that's the good news over here. Um, and so we have to develop our defenses. What I, what I said in that foreign policy article is okay, we can now create new pandemics, but the good thing is we can also cure disease much more rapidly. That, you know, just like with this microRNA vaccine, it was only within 40, 45 days or so that they, uh, they were able to produce the vaccine. It took months to test it. Next time around, we could probably produce a vaccine in three or four days. So what you do is you find that uh, China has now created a new strain of some bubonic plague or something, you know, it, and they tested it out in Congo. You get someone to sequence the, um, uh, the, 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 that gene there and then, put it on the internet, you ship it and you, uh, uh, put it through your supercomputers here, and then you uh, uh, get them to 3D print the, uh, the vaccine or the treatment over there. All of this happens within 24 hours. This is what's possible in the next few years or so. So just like we had, you know, uh, when first I had computers, they were, the piece, you know, nice little things, toys for a while, and then, then they became inter uh, connected to the internet. We uh, People started developing viruses for them. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We develop antiviruses. So it's the same with technology that we're going to develop viruses, literal viruses. So we now have the ability to develop antiviruses. It's good versus evil. So China is able to hack into our computers and steal. So we develop defenses to steal back or to limit them from what they do. That's the name of the game. Vivek, how, how do we put democracy, that is um, an honest representation of the interests of the people, how do we put it on offense instead of defense in this fast tech era? This is, uh, you know, in my book, Driving the Driverless Car, the whole book was about, about this. What I said was that, uh, um, we, you know, uh, we, we need to have uh, laws, but laws are codified ethics. What are ethics? Ethics are consensus that develops in the society over time. So, uh, and so before you can develop ethics, you have to understand what you're developing ethics for. So we need to start educating uh, the public now on many of these things. So on social media, everyone has learned the good and the bad of it. So we can now come to a consensus on what's good and what's evil on that. We need to start learning about these other technologies now and developing a consensus on what is right and what's ethical. So, uh, you know, we talked about China do, uh, doing a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, a couple of decades ago, when it uh, first became possible to clone human beings, mm -hmm. there was an uproar worldwide about it. And we essentially have international treaties that banned cloning. Mm -hmm. Not to say that you know, countries didn't do it. They probably did still do it. However, they dared not talk about it. Mm -hmm. There were no incentives for, for scientists to publish papers. There were no incentives to release any clones out there. So it didn't happen. 
So we need to now come to interna have international treaties which say that you can't genetically engineer human beings. You can't genetically engineer viruses, that you can't 3D print um, you know, the, the, these type of uh, organisms. We need to have international treaties which basically sue it. And if, and if you do it, you become a pariah and the whole world turns against you. So democracy's offense is regulation, but regulation seems defensive on its face. Um, I just wonder if, if we couldn't, through some Aikido here, flip the power dynamic so that at, at, as I think way back in the 90s, people thought the internet would do, right? People thought the internet would be the technology that supercharged democracy because it would give a voice to everyone. <laughs> but that didn't quite turn out as imagined. But is there a, is there a way to, to flip the script so that it's democratic values, which are not just trying to fend off erosion, but rather uh, use technology and its organ our social organization in such a way that democracy is advantaged, not on the, on the back heel. You're talking about uh, democracy in the, in the age of uh, exponential technologies. And the answer is yes, definitely we could do that. Because look at the way we're talking right now. You can bring together people no matter where they are, and you can start educating, you can start inspiring, mm. you can start discussing, you can start debating, you can now start coming to, you know, building consensus all remotely, right? We have the ability now to reach anyone anywhere on the planet. Yeah, but uh, so does about. QAnon, so do white supremacists who are talking as we're talking right now, no doubt. So we need to use technology for good versus evil. So we've seen how it's been used for evil. Let's figure out how to use it for good now. Imagine if Facebook, uh, uh, had enlightened leadership and they said, okay, we're going to use uh, our tools. We're going to promote stories that create harmony. We're going to ha have the Democrats learn about the Republicans and have the Republicans learn about Democrats. Fine, we'll make a little bit less money, but we'll be making the world a better place. You know, these, all these anti-vaxxers who believe that the vaccines are evil, well, let's educate them on uh, the, what the vaccines can do. And let's now take the, uh, you know, uh, the things that went wrong and, and take it to the scientists. And if Facebook decided it would be a force for good versus, you know, for making money, we could have incredible things happen. But that's the type of, you know, that's the one thing that's, we have to learn how to use technology for good versus evil. We have to now have the better side of humanity take control. Well, let's pray that we get past this standoff in Washington, that we, we, come, will. Out, we, we, we will. come out of it with some kind of effective deterrence to a repeat of what we saw on January 6th, to a repeat of insurrection, um, and that we think ambitiously enough, big enough to really grapple with these problems because as we pretend that they're not <laughs> in the driver's seat, they keep driving. And, and the road we're on in the last month has not looked so great, it really hasn't. We'll get out of this. This this will just be. We're actually going to forget about it before you before too long. Just like we're going to forget about the pandemic, and you know, lives will be normal. We're going to be you know, ooh eyeing at the technology, and then we're going to have all sorts of new debates about new problems that have arisen. But that's you know, like I said, welcome welcome to the future. <laughs> well, the future has got seeds in it that should concern us, though, and I think I hope that January sixth and the insurrection gets people's minds focused in a way that they really go to the root of what happened there and why it happened and work on an organization intelligently of human effort, venture, technology that points us in a better direction because that we do not need to be doing again. I completely agree with you, my friend. Vivek Wadwa, author most recently of From Incremental to Exponential. It's very good to see you. Um, thanks so much for taking the time today and come back and talk to us as we plunge on into that future. Anytime. Bye for now, Vivek. Vivek. So long. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Yeah, Ashbrook Live. <laughs> 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 I was running out here. See you, Vivek. Take it easy. <laughs>